Uh, fantastic. Um, morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I know um, I can see the audience just trickling in, so we'll start shortly in a second. Otherwise, uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll start very shortly. I see, I see the numbers coming up. Um, that's okay. Um, okay, I think, we, I think we can start. Um, but no, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the call today. Before we begin, there are just a few housekeeping points. When joining the internet link, you would have been given the option of joining through your computer's audio or dialing in via the telephone. If you have difficulty connecting to the audio, Please message the Centre for Science and Security Studies or host using the chat box. On a PC or a laptop, the chat box is to the right hand side. If you're using a phone or a tablet, you will have to toggle the view to see this. To manage the session, this is all one way audio. All participants are currently muted. So if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A box. If you're using a PC or a laptop, again, the Q&A button is at the bottom of the screen. And if you're using a smartphone or tablet, you will have to toggle the view to see this. Please also use the opportunity to ensure that all slides are visible and minimize any features such as participant videos that you may find distracting. So today's session is called Gender Parity and Nuclear Security. And I'm pleased to be joined by four excellent panelists who are gonna give us uh, their views on nuclear security and the role of women within that. We have Natalia Kloss, we have Shurina Loka uh, Benitza, sorry for that, um, Comfort of Fordu, and Katarina Vila. Um, some excellent panelists, I'm very excited. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. The way today's session is going to start, um, we're gonna have some opening remarks. Um, each of our panelists will be taking us through um, their areas of nuclear security which are important to them and their experiences in the field. We're going to have a second part, which will be a panel discussion, and we're going to be centering a discussion around two main um, areas of thought. Um, why the causes of inequality in the field, and then practical steps leaders can take, um, with a particular focus on how organisational change can be brought about by senior leadership and their advocacy. Before we start, though, um, I would like to hand over to Natalia. Um, so Natalia, um, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you want to give just a very brief introduction about yourself, um, and then um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. It's a big pleasure to participate in this interesting uh, topic because gender uh, equality it's an important uh, part of our life. It's a fifth goal of sustainable development of the world announced by the. UN Nations uh, for um, a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. And uh, it's a time to discuss those issues in, in connection with nuclear security. We see many threats and risk. Now it's happened uh, around the world and uh, mostly in Ukraine. And I think uh, uh, to discuss all those questions uh, will be very uh, interesting and beneficial for all of us. Thank you for everybody who joined us and I thank you to King's College who organized this webinar in White House and uh, later on I will talk about the Black Sea Women in Nuclear Network and we uh, I want to mention that I see many names who join from our network and appreciate this. So uh, to start our um, discussion in a more interesting way we actually uh, uh, send uh, before the webinar some survey, and we want to share with you the results. Uh, uh, the survey was pretty short one. We uh, start from the, the demographics, uh, who, who you are and what is your age. But uh, there was a couple more main questions. Have you ever been treated differently at work because of your gender? Do you think your gender has impacted your opportunities and progress in the field? And use three words to describe your experience in the field and use three words to, words to describe the impacts of a more inclusive work environment. What is a gender equality for you? So, um, Carl, can you 
change the slide, please. Uh, sorry, this uh, we try to to give you all information and a little bit small pictures, but uh, we have uh, received 32 answers. And uh, the age of our uh, interview was uh, from uh, 25 to 64. We have uh, 12 male, male and 20 female answers. You can see here a map uh, of countries who participate uh, in uh, this survey from the United States, uh, Africa, Eurasia, like uh, uh, England, Ukraine, India, you can see it, and other countries. Sorry, uh, it's a big one. So, next. Uh, have you ever been treated differently at work because of your gender? Uh, uh, this answer you can see here um, who strongly can say that not at all, it was only 10 people. Other answers, actually, it's a more positive. It doesn't matter much, do you think it's a great deal or a little bit, but you are being treated. And this scale shows that uh, the problem is exist. And uh, this webinar is very important to discuss those issues. Next slide, please. And thank you, Carl, that you made this because it's amazing uh, to show that uh, actually, we are very focused on the women's rights, of course, and uh, uh, this uh, dedicated mostly to the um, women uh, in the nuclear security field. But uh, we need to be honest with us that everybody uh, suffers from this uh, different attitude to you, to you. Yeah, so we received also uh, answer from the males that they are also treated because of their gender. This is exists in our world and we need to make sure that it won't uh, go further. Next slide, please. Do you think your gender has impacted your opportunities and progress in the field? Definitely, yes. There were seven people. Definitely not. We have four people. And uh, uh, our problem here is other numbers. And so um, in somehow, of course, I think um, if you are talking nuclear security, that uh, men are strong on the position and they are work all the time and uh, has some privileges to, to have a job in this field. But we see uh, that also the problem exists in this area for them too. And uh, uh, which is, uh, I uh, personally like that at least six uh, women in nuclear security actually, uh, oh, two women, uh, not uh, really has a career problems. Sorry. Next slide, please. Use three words to describe your experience in the field. Um, the most popular uh, words here is a challenging interesting, uh, knowledge, gender, ever some, enlightening, existing, rewarding, rewarding. and uh, um, um, I would say um, people are most using uh, uh, action words, verbs, to descri describe their uh, experience from the gender balance view because uh, if you uh, see on these pictures you are not really uh, talking here about the nuclear security because i mean like a professional way but how we are living this field and uh, we can find uh, some words like uh, denied opportunities sexual harassment and i hope uh, this person who wrote this uh, has a proper protection and uh, received uh, help and support from the colleagues too. Um, as a word, it's a, a wonderful experience, opener, bias, good behavior. It's very, very different opinion how people describe their uh, experience in the field. I would say that uh, my experience in nuclear security, it's a, uh, uh, Surprising every time because so many topics you 
the opening in different ways. Next slide, please. Use free words to describe the impact of a more inclusive work environment. Productivity, collaboration, uh, opportunities, team, innovation, resourceful uh, results, coordination, work, cooperation, and uh, uh, increasing of uh, attention to the issue of gender balance will give the good results for, for everybody. And uh, the main, uh, I would say, word what is uh, really gives you uh, the result is a coordination, collaboration, cooperation. It's a different word, but with the same meaning of the need, the, the discovery that we need to combine our efforts for better productivity. Other slide, please. What is the gender equality for you? Selected. So, uh, uh, gender equality makes us all grow together in the area of professionalism without discrimination, having equal opportunities for both sexes. Equality is an evaluation of rewards and rights. It's a process where by both women and men get the same rights and organization. And uh, I'm really appreciate for this honest answers for uh, our inter uh, interviewers and uh, I hope that uh, results of this webinar will be used for uh, future increasing attention to the gender quality in your organization. Or you will find here friends with whom you can raise this topic and issue among your organization. I think it is the last slide, this way, yeah. And I would uh, ask uh, Shorena to continue our discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Greetings to everyone. I'm from Georgia. I'm a founder and board member of Civil Council on Defense and Security. This is non-governmental organization. And uh, one of the, one of our uh, sphere of uh, working is uh, gender equality in defense and security institutions. And also we are doing um, some facilitation, dialogue, research, capacity building in nuclear security and non-proliferation field in Georgia, and facilitate dialogue between civil society, academia, expert community, governments, industries, um, and international organizations as well. Um, thank you very much uh, um, for bringing this topic into the discussion, because um, yes, so of course, uh, inequalities, gender bias, um, they are still a part of uh, our lives and especially in the fields which are um, traditionally, let's say, uh, patriarchal culture dominated, uh, male dominated. And these are definitely um, nuclear security and security field itself. Um, uh, it's, um, uh, but on the other hand, um, as you uh, said, Natalia, in analyzing this very, a small little survey you know, we have conducted, uh, uh, male and female, different genders have different experiences of gender. And uh, we don't know it was positive or negative in our surveys, but it means that yes, uh, we are diverse, we have different attitudes. Uh, and the main thing is that uh, we need to understand and reflect uh, definitely institutions uh, need uh, to reflect on gender relations because they definitely impact our personal lives, our professional lives, and the all in all uh, decision-making process in the institutions. That's why, um, and decision-making is the most important thing, especially in democracies. And if we thrive for a good governance, effective, uh, um, transparent, open institutions where there are equal opportunities for everyone. Uh, my point here is uh, based on uh, Georgian experience. Uh, uh, there is great uh, importance of legal and institutional support to gender equality and gender parity. So I would say this, this language issue is also very interesting because uh, in Georgia, we mainly speak about gender equality because for us, uh, it's uh, first of all, uh, 
um, uh, understanding the concept, internalize the concept of equal opportunities, of equity, of equal rights, uh, and of course parity, which is more uh, um, on ratio, on um, uh, quantitative, let's say, indicators of uh, gender representation in institutions. That's uh, for me maybe kind of next step, but also very important. So, for instance, in Georgia, in Georgia's political institutions, uh, um, we are striving so much, but in Parliament we have only near 30% of women after um, adoption of gender equality legislation, uh, special legislation for uh, election code and so on, forth and so on. But if you see on different levels like municipalities, very few women there, especially on decision making, but with decision making authorities. So what does it mean? We, we definitely need um, reflecting on these topics, uh, enshrining and um, internalizing gender equality um, uh, concepts uh, in, in different institutions. Uh, uh, when we speak about uh, nuclear security in Georgia, it's kind of let's let's uh, um, uh, speak about it as a broader concept. Yeah, so Georgia has no nuclear power plants or anything, but we have uh, um, labs, we have medical sector, of course, we have uh, um, uh, government institutions uh, in charge of nuclear and radiological security, and of course we need to look into these institutions and see what's going on there because we in the uh, scientific sector, there are still no women. It means that this patriarchal culture, this socialization we have about uh, professions for men and women, of course, they are still influencing our um, decisions and our choices, professional choices. So there is a lot to be done. But my mm, takeaway from my personal experience working uh, in the field uh, is that we need uh, uh, a lot of it, um, we need reflecting on the gender situations about gender bias in the institutions. We need to reflect on the institutional and organizational cultures from the gender perspective. And we need to uh, prevent all the obstacles for all gender to benefit from the opportunities we are creating and there are for us. Um, and. Um, especially when we speak about nuclear security. And I, I, I can't uh, stop myself to say that we, there is war in Ukraine now. We have faced Russia's aggressive uh, military aggression in Ukraine. And uh, um, uh, it means that um, we need to take uh, certain measures. We need more inclusive decision-making to stress on that. We need uh, more women and men and uh, equally of them to take uh, rational decisions for the peace uh, uh, and for the um, health and um, security of, uh, of our um, people. So from that perspective, and I will conclude with that, um, uh, we need some legal binding documents to adhere them. We need reflecting on organizational cultures and we need to make sure that uh, inclusivity uh, diversity and gender equality are part of our um, um, everyday life. And first of all, our organizational cultures are based on these principles. Thank you very much. And um, I'm sure that there will be some questions and uh, happy to uh, engage. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and um, uh, let me uh, ask a comfort to join in. Comfort, please share your views. Yes, from different continents. It's so in incredibly interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharina. Uh, I think Natalia, in fact, might be the next speaker. Yes, it's Natalia. So thank you, Sharina. No worries at all. Um, Natalia, over to you, if I may. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it uh, was a long preparation and uh, uh, very interesting one. Uh, thank you, Shrena. You raised uh, an important issue about uh, gender balance and equity and equality. And uh, when you work in this field, uh, this uh, right indication about the uh, need to work with gender equality, you understand the, this tiny difference. But uh, um, next slide, please. 
I want uh, to share this uh, newly established uh, network that we actually just created, Black Sea Women in Nuclear Network. And uh, Shirena, as uh, our active member and uh, head of uh, Working Group One, she's uh, uh, just reflect that uh, idea that we work on the, about our network. So our motto sounds like uniting women, leading change, and making waves. I hope uh, today uh, webinar will create some ways uh, that help uh, people to uh, to see the results in the gender balance. Next slide. And what is very important here is to uh, create uh, uh, barrier-free and diverse opportunities for women. Uh, of course, our network is uh, uh, more uh, dedicated to Black Sea region and in, includes uh, Bulgaria, Georgia, Romania, Turkey, Ukraine, Moldova, and open for other countries and, other, and uh, any uh, experts who want to cooperate with us. Uh, but uh, I think our vision of uh, future development of this network is very much for the idea for everybody. Create a barrier-free uh, uh, area for cooperation and uh, for professionalism. And uh, so we recognize our mission as uh, uh, support, connect and empower women in nuclear fields. We are start as an expert in nuclear security and non proliferation and I would say that our main uh, area of expertise and, uh, and work, but we are combine uh, all um, women in nuclear field. And in STEM, in academia, in industry, we have very diverse representation in our network. And, uh, I, and we are deciding that uh, our area of activities will uh, power gender equality, which means that uh, our uh, side should be really, really, really equal. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So uh, last week, it was our first public recognition. We participate uh, on the International Conference on Safety and Security of Radioactive Sources uh, in, uh, organized by IEA in the headquarter. We have their booth. You can see pictures of us, me and uh, Margarita Kalinina Paul, uh, our initiator of uh, this network, and Ms. Irina Chirinichenko, she's uh, from organization like a generation also is a member of the network and you can see I chose the pictures with the man who actually uh, leave the history of our picture our first gathering and it was uh, very interesting how people react actually on this network everybody was very supportive and very interesting to heard about uh, this network and uh, I would say somebody kind of like says like you know we have so big problem to finding experts among the women to participate in different meetings. Can you advise us somebody? I like say, oh, I have so good list. I can uh, send uh, many uh, excellent experts to participate in many meetings. Just tell us where to send. And uh, I think uh, public recognition is very important. And I hope that other organizations will have the same opportunity to be more visible. Next slide. Since uh, uh, we are talking about uh, the crisis time and war in Ukraine. Uh, uh, our network was established in the December last year. We have first inauguration uh, webinar and uh, we have many plans to meetings, to for discussions and uh, we plan to have some follow-up meetings about what it starts and it creates uh, many different uh, uh, different opportunities for us, I would say. So as uh, uh, experts in this field, we understand all threats and, uh, and uh, risks in nuclear uh, field. We will create a statement of our network about regional, um, about uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, call open unity for achieving peace and security where we describe uh, uh, all our uh, thoughts about this and how dangerous this war for, for nuclear facilities and 
for whole uh, population and society, and we need to stop it. And uh, um, also, we are not talking about here, our main goal is supporting of our members and other experts in the field. And uh, uh, we create a WhatsApp group before actually war. And this WhatsApp group was a very good um, tool to have a humanitarian support because uh, we have uh, we need to move many people from dangerous area and not we are not talking here about nuclear facilities but we are talking about whole Ukraine and different possibilities and information so there was we share kind of information to work with disinformation that exists against Ukraine and we work with uh, information how to very safe place what country can provide. We have a lot of support from Romania. Our member, Madalina Stefani, provides us very strong support in this issue. And uh, we share information about people who volunteers to take people from battlefield to battlefield to the safe place. And it was really incredible gathering. And we are continuing this. So our, uh, our networking and the membership, it's uh, more than professional way, it's supporting of each other in our or your our life, and even this informal network helps us to organize. And uh, I won't stop here, and uh, to give the floor, there are our contacts, our website, Facebook, and you and uh, address in uh, email. So if you have an opportunity, uh, contact us. We can you can join uh, to our network. Um, but perhaps it's a good chance to um, um, open up the floor while we overcome some of the technical issues and go to um, the second part of today's webinar, which is going to be um, a discussion perhaps on um, some of the wider issues which everyone has touched on. Um, and if I may, just um, the two themes I'd like to talk about or for the panel to talk about are the wider causes of inequality in the field and perhaps some of the practical steps which leaders can take from organisations. Um, and it's a shame, I, I know Comfort had a lot of um, in her case study about some of those, so hopefully she, um, Comfort can join us. Um, but before that happens, um, maybe a question to the panel just on the wider causes. Um, perceptions came up a lot in, uh, in the discussions, um, perception of uh, self, perception of people in organisations, uh, and perceptions, are, I think, of opportunities as well. So actually, perhaps um, related to point one and the wider causes for inequality. Um, Natalia, if I can um, address the first question to you um, before we hand it over to the panel. Um, but could we uh, perhaps talk about some of the stereotypes and um, you've come across it in your experience, Natalia. Uh, what are these stereotypes? How do these hold us and organizations back um, from more equitable outcomes? Stereotypes, uh, if uh, we are talking about my, my personal experience, I would say it's uh, mostly like you're a girl, you don't need it. Uh, you don't need to know or do you need to participate? It's uh, enough for you. There are those kind of wording I was uh, heard like a really long time during my life and uh, it was really hard to, in the beginning to say that uh, uh, your knowledge is also is important and your experience in the field is, should be count. Uh, and uh, the stereotype I would say is that uh, at least in my field in Ukraine, uh, men really don't want to see women on the table. So uh, later on, after 20 years in the field, like uh, people used to understand I'm not leaving and I uh, know something, okay, you can stay here. But uh, mostly if they even have the opportunity to say something really unpolite about you, they're using this. This has happened with stereotypes, and unfortunately, uh, uh, what is the most common answer was what she can know. She's a girl. 
take them. I, yeah. I can see, uh, I see a lot of um, heads nodding there. Sharina, did you have any thoughts on that? Is that similar to what you've... Um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you for bringing this issue. So um, uh, I mentioned in my presentation, the, mainly the stereotypes are also very much linked to the um, socialization and um, a profession, uh, choices of profession, uh, which are mainly uh, because of, I mean, yeah, so there are some stereotypes which profession are men's and women's and that, that's very much influenced. But uh, what I want to draw attention to is um, participation of women um, in decision making. For instance, now there is a um, uh, summit, NATO summit is in Madrid and no single woman representative in Georgian delegation. So I think that Georgia is not the unique country having no women in the, as part of delegation, but this, this uh, speaks about something. And yesterday there was a picture, um, our government representatives versus French government, which were all women and president. So, I mean, that, that speaks about a lot of things. Yeah, it, it speaks about the inclusivity and the attitude. And sometimes even if you don't want, you at least think that what should others think if, uh, we are only men or <laughs> so even there is no this sensitivity sometimes and that's very sad because uh, on the other hand uh, there are so many knowledgeable men and women who are also strive for and protecting and strive for equality so for me that's very very good indicator who is representing country who is representing the field how this representation is uh, uh, divided and um, uh, yeah and perceived uh, so that's that's a very important thing so, uh, and I think that our eyes and ears should be very sensitive towards that and uh, uh, what you mentioned Carl and uh, what we have advocacy I mean for gender parity equality it's uh, drawing attention and be sensitive towards these issues and uh, as uh, and representation of both genders are very important because uh, the problem uh, Katrina was uh, saying, and this heartbreaking uh, thing, I mean, war happening in Ukraine. Um, I mean, it's not possible to solve these issues uh, with, uh, yeah, it, it needs um, comprehensive, uh, um, I mean, solutions. And um, these solutions without inclusivity is not possible to my mind. And um, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sharina. And Catherine, I see you nodding along there as well. Um, and I know you, you're um, in a position within, being within sort of, uh, certainly the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs uh, for Ukraine. Is, um, can you give perhaps some insight into different experiences uh, within a governmental setting? Um, as Sharina said, you know, optics are important, not just because they reflect reality, but they also um, reflect aspirations and inspiration for people looking to, to go into the field, but could you give um, your own perspective on um, gender equality uh, in, a, in a governmental setting? Um, yes, um, I, I totally agree with uh, Sharena that uh, representation uh, during the international events uh, is uh, a great indicator uh, on the uh, gender equity in the state. Um, I think that in Ukraine the uh, situation is slightly better, but um, because we do have uh, for Ukrainian members of the delegation in, in NATO, uh, for example, our ambassador to NATO is a woman. So, um, uh, but uh, at the same time, it depends on the areas. Um, if we speak on nuclear issues and nuclear security, for example, nuclear regulator, Ministry of Energy, um, I can see gender equity. I can see it even in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But if we speak on um, such issues as military technical cooperation, um, when I participate in meetings, I can see about 50 men and I'm the only woman. Um, and um, it's a um, very like, like closed club and uh, there is no gender equity at all. So it's uh, the disbalance between the areas, between the spheres. And in, in nuclear issue, I can confirm that um, it, is, um, uh, it, it is better in Ukraine. And if, if we take the Minister of Foreign Affairs, 
um, we have uh, we have special program uh, of um, promoting gender equity and uh, even we have a very interesting installation on the first floor uh, of the ministry um, it's um, um, portraits of women who have become ambassadors and um, who have um, high uh, positions and uh, next to uh, these photos there are mirrors a lot of mirrors so any woman can come and look and see herself in the in future to be on the on the high position how that uh, hope that uh, we will do this and uh, one uh, s um, small point uh, that um, and but very important point is that um, now we are a candidate uh, country to uh, join the united uh, the european union and um, definitely um, among um, our obligations is uh, to um, adopt um, respectful legislation on human rights and on equity, etc. So I hope that we'll go quickly on, on, on that direction. Thanks, Katharina. That's, um, that's great to hear. I can see Comfort, ha um, her video is kind of intermittent, but hopefully Comfort, you're available. Um, wonderful. Um, Excellent. Natalia, I can see your hand is up, but Comfort, I just want to draw perhaps on some of the themes which we've talked about, which is the institutional settings. And I know your organization, the um, NSCDC, the Nigerian Security Civil Defense Corps, um, when, we, when we visited last month, it was, it was great to see actually so many women around the table um, in, a, in a business setting. And I know you've talked about the um, Because Action Plan and how the institution has sought to address this. Um, if your connection is able, um, are, you, are you happy to talk about the action plan and how, how your organization sort of saw that um, change? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think um, I can go on now. I want to apologize for that uh, little electronic hitches. So <laughs> no, can no you worries. my slide on now? Um, Comfort. Do you want to um, do you want to talk to your slides, or um, or are you, would would it be would it be better perhaps just okay to, okay um, um I can go on I can go on without the slide. Um, I work with Nigerian Security and Civil Defence Corps, as I've said, and um, my in twenty nineteen or, or like, should I tell you to about civil defence? We are um, paramilitary agents in Nigeria. We, uh, we have a core mandate of protecting national and critical infrastructure in the country, among other, um, other mandates. But well, I'm focusing on this because we are looking at nuclear facilities and nuclear security. So um, in 2019, the Rule of Law and the Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria, in partnership with United Nations Women, evaluated integration of gender equality measures in security sector institutions. They did this by conducting a gender assessment of three former security institutions, namely the Nigerian Police Force, the Nigerian Army, and the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. The assessment conducted at the first level was within the framework of a two-year program on women, peace, and security in Nigeria. It was between 2019 and 2020. Um, it was also implemented by the UN Women with Funding Support from the government of Norway. Well, the reason for this, the study was sought to examine the nature of the gender representation and composition of the selected security institutions. It was also to identify the level of progress and the integration of gender sensitivity within these security institutions from 2017 to date. Uh, it was also highlighted the discriminatory policies and practices that hinder recruitment performance and career advancement of women in the security institutions. Um, at, when this was done, the, um, through the findings, it was discovered that there was a low level of awareness of United Nations security resolution 1325 and its corresponding national action plan on women, peace, and security among the personnel in my organizations. So it was at this juncture that my, um, my organization 
after the findings and the way they observe there is a need for us to develop um, this gender policy document. My um, commander in general, who is also very, very uh, passionate about gender, um, who also promotes gender in our, our organization, when we assumed office, in, when immediately he assumed office, the first thing he did to promote women was to establish um, a female squad. Okay, he established female squad that bears arms that comprises of 75 officers. This was under his leadership. And he said, and I quote, I believe that NCDC can lead the way towards better well-being by building a fairer and more equal workplace. If there is one sector that should set the precedent in this space, it is NCDC. So my commandant general actually supports gender uh, mainstream in the sector. So we went ahead to develop the policy, gender policy documents that we're using today. Uh, I would have liked to see my slides. So um, how can you show me yeah, some slides? Sorry. I can do that. Some point. Thanks. Uh, tell me one comfort. Um, okay, um, so I want to just say some point here. No, no, no. Um, go front. Okay, um, stay put. No, no, down a little. One. Uh -huh. Now, we already know the uh, challenges confronting women, so I'm not going to that. I'll go to the process. Go to slide, the uh, second to the last slide. Okay, okay, let's start from here. No, let's start from that. The, the other one. Okay, okay, overview of stakeholders' efforts. So um, these are the efforts that were made. We first of all, in the process of developing the uh, policy measures in security sector institutions by conducting a gender assessment of former security institutions, which I've mentioned. We also went ahead to examine the nature of gender representation and composition of the selected security institutions, the three, we talked about the Nigerian police, the Nigerian army, and the Nigerian security and civil defense corps. And currently, the Nigerian army also have developed this gender policy document. Nigerian security and civil defense corps also have developed. So Nigerian police, which I'm sure that the process of developing their own document too. Uh, we also identified the level of progress in the integration of gender sensitivity within these security institutions. I'll highlight the discriminatory processes and practices that hinder the recruitment, performance, and career advancement of women in the security sections, institutions, sorry. Then the next one, um, the last one. Sorry, uh, because of my time, I'm sorry for that. Uh, so um, developing an internal gender policy document to promote gender equality, starting with its operations, processes, and management practices. Uh, these documents work around, um, we look at the gender unit. The unit is su supposed to have overall responsibility for implementing the policy at all levels. The unit is also should be responsible for performance appraisal of the policy to ensure regular review of its status. Uh, it's also in the policy is also sexual uh, exploitation abuse disciplinary committee that will receive complaints from others and the public on allegations of sexual exploitation, abuses, gender-based violence, and discrimination. They will also investigate these uh, allegations and impose sanctions and discipline or air on every personnel found guilty of any sexual exploitation and abuses. Excellent, thank you, Kampa. Um, well, I'm gonna just jump in here and sorry to cut you off. Um, a it's little okay, bit. it's okay. Thank you for this time. I'm sorry for the uh, interruption earlier. Thank you very much. No, not at all. Um, it, it's wonderful to hear that and it's wonderful to hear the Commandant General's support and driving this. I think leadership is really important. And what I wanted to do is, um, before we go out, is um, uh, maybe perhaps just um, bring your attention to um, George, who's on the line. Um, sorry, Natalia, I'll come back to you. Um, George, are you there? 
Yeah, I'm here, Carl, yeah. Excellent. So we have a wonderful set of panelists as well, but um, one thing we wanted to talk about in the discussion was the role of leadership um, and ways in which we can have advocacy um, for change through senior leadership. Um, so it's wonderful he to hear about the Commandant General and the initiatives there. I think that's a really good example. Um, but for those of you who are less familiar with George, um, George, perhaps just a brief introduction and maybe um, maybe some of your thoughts about how senior leadership um, can, can advocate in a formal programme, but perhaps also less formally as well. And then Natalia, over to you. Sorry, if I may. Sure. Well, um, for, the, for those who haven't come across me in the new security culture programme, um, I'm one of the consulting partners of my business. And um, I'm perhaps um, one of those stereotypes that, that, um, that I've heard sp spoken about. Hopefully I'm not too stereotypical, but I'm um, ex-military, first director of security at Category 1 nuclear decommissioning site, then managing director of security business unit. And I've been delivering um, nuclear security and resilience uh, consultancy services across the civil and defense networks in this country and overseas um, in the last five years. Um, and notably, I've just come off a, a very large um, licensee in this country where this particular topic was some of the things, one of the things that we were discussing. But before I go into a few comments, I'd like to just really commend everybody, actually. It's been a, an education and eye opener for me, which is great. Um, but I think what I'd also say um, is what is a test of really how, um, you know, gender equality and equality of opportunity impacts is whether any of you can see yourselves being at the top of the tree of your profession in the next 10 or 15 years, perhaps in your own country. Um, because that's where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? Um, policies at leadership le at government level and below, at uh, sector level and in uh, licensee levels are really, really important. But it's what actions are taken and what you see happening, which is the most important indication of success and the successful application of those policies. Um, uh, and we haven't got it entirely right in the UK yet either. Um, but it is notable that the head of the Defence Nuclear Organisation in this country is a three-star um, female leader who's been in security and nuclear for 20 years uh, and she's a civil servant. Um, she's not ex-military or anything like that. Um, there's no stereotype about her and she's been extremely successful and a number of her subordinate senior le leaders are, are females as well. But what I would say more generally in a licensee and a nuclear establishment, they aren't at the moment. That isn't the case and more work needs to be done on that. Uh, and I think your advocacy is going to do a lot to help progression on those issues. What, but I'm just going to go through a few points which I've made, made note of here, which hopefully will draw in some aspects of leadership that I've experienced. Um, I've sat at the executive committee level, I've sat at board level in nuclear security, and I see and work at that level as well. And what I would say is, uh, uh, and I think Sharena brought this up during her comments, is that this really it's important language is important and parity is not the issue here parity is a statistical um balance if you like and i think equality of opportunity is the key issue here uh, and driving that equality of opportunity the present state in nuclear security and perhaps more engineering stem skills more more widely in the nuclear sector certainly in this country is that they're male um, nuclear security tends to be ex-military uh, for the most part and that's where some of the stereotypical behaviours and cultures come in. Um, they also bring a considerable advantage in terms of their experience, but it needs to be a balance in that. Uh, and what I do see is a rebalancing occurring in this country. Uh, and in some areas, it's occurring at pace. And I ask myself, what are the drivers behind that? Uh, and I think maybe there are three drivers in simple terms. One is that there are some trends, if you like, there are fashions within national, regional and sector levels. Um, I don't think that's the key driver, though. I think the key drivers are the social ethics behind this and the optics about it. Inequality and opportunity in nuclear security more widely in engineering STEM skills is just wrong. It doesn't make sense, you know. But one of the reasons it doesn't make sense is because there's a commercial imperative behind it. Um, and I'm reflecting on that commercial imperative in the UK where we have a growing defence nuclear sector, um, and that's common knowledge, it's open source. We have a burgeoning and growing uh, civil nuclear sector as well. 
and there is intense competition for engineers um, across the STEM skills. Uh, and, and that is reflected in the security environment as well, because security functionality is increasing in terms of its scale and its requirements. Got that, Carl, thank you. Uh, and so to meet this, one has to draw from the pool of potential and that pool of potential has got to include both sexes. Uh, it's not easy though to do that in an environment where the demographic shows that for the most part the age of people in nuclear security is in the late 30s, 40s, 50s perhaps. And what it requires is investment in every aspect of recruiting and at every level to fill that out and give equal opportunity to men and women and take the best athlete. But what I would say the best athlete should be reflected in the fact that there has to be a more rapid rebalancing and equ equity of opportunity across both sexes and particularly in favor of the females, because that brings commercial benefit, um, because there's a commercial requirement behind that now, not least of which is socially more ethical to do so. And it's the right and proper thing to do. And so one asks oneself, how do you do that? Well, I think the first thing is that leaders need to recognize that inequality exists. And they equally need to recognize the benefits that can be brought by addressing it. Um, and then they need to use their position of authority to shape and influence and enable and facilitate that change. And that means enacting, putting policies in place, but then being seen to enact them and being seen to drive them and being seen to lead them. And whether you're a male or a female leader, that's what the responsibility of leaders is. So they need to advocate change. They need to in incentivize it, but they need to be there at the front leading it and pulling it. But they need to be there at the back pushing it as well. They need to be able to measure its impacts and review and analyze that and then change. But part of that is about the through life career management of opportunity and everybody here and in my military and commercial experience needs to understand how they can go from the bottom row as an, as an apprentice perhaps or as a junior security leader to the top. They need to understand there's a clear route there and they need to be incentivized to follow that route and what's important in that is for leaders and line managers to pick people and accelerate them who have potential rather than just re resting on past performance. Career management tends to rest on past performance. It needs to look at potential so it can drive people into positions where they can realize their potential and their opportunity. Um, and that all needs to be done, I think, at the moment in an environment of active and positive discrimination, because it's the only way you can accelerate it, you know, to get to a place there where there is better equality of opportunity and you can stabilize it, um, you know, and it's, I was relating to how in this country, I was discussing this with two female senior colleagues yesterday and relating to how you really generate changes, put a policy in place and then see that it's led. And I reflected on how we in this country impose the wearing of seatbelts. You know, um, it was incentivized. There was a huge public information uh, campaign, but then there were penalties of getting it wrong as well. And the penalties of getting it wrong are commercial penalties because you don't realize the advantage that actually the quality of opportunity drives and bringing in more females into it. And the last thing I'd say is that leadership is about leading teams. People are teams and teams benefit from the greatest diversity of membership of the teams and the skills they bring. And that enables us to innovate better and more frequently at a greater tempo than perhaps we do at the moment in the nuclear security environment. Thank you, George. Um, and I think it's really interesting how you're connecting um, business necessity, the benefits there, because um, what we're talking about, culture can't change overnight. And some of the wider things Shireen has talked about, workplace culture, social culture, but also we can connect that to the need to plan for industry, the way that commercial entities need to plan for their own um, way in which they encourage um, the next generation and the way they cast their nets um, for their staff, because ultimately we need to link wider attitudes to individual workplaces. And the benefits which you know, I think you're, you're talking about there, um, we can see that, we can see the, the reflection of what sort of greater equity can mean in, in this word cloud, which came from a survey. Um, Natalia, I know you've been very patient <laughs> uh, with that, so I'm gonna bring it back to you. 
if I may. I know we're a little over time now, so um, we should do that. But Natalia, I'm going to bring it back to you before going to the other panellists for their concluding thoughts. But um, how are you reflecting on this, uh, on, on the themes we've discussed? Well, I'm so thrilled that uh, we have this uh, excellent uh, panelist here because everybody raised uh, so very important issues during the presentations and uh, some comments. And uh, I actually wrote some ideas uh, for using later in our network activities. And uh, one uh, at I also want uh, to stress that importance of legal support. Shorena raised this issue in her speech before, and uh, I just remember that I was um, in Ukraine. I was using very a lot of examples. Actually, what was changing in Ukraine? Because our constitutions, it's about uh, 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 human rights and about women rights uh, and the equal opportunities for men and women. We have uh, even national law. But uh, law without any actions, it's not enough. But it's a good uh, basis for creating these actions. And uh, in recent years, there was uh, uh, done in many things. And uh, when we are talking about nuclear security, we are mostly talking about people who work on the facilities. But we are forget about wider representation of the women who work in, in the security field. It's a border guard. It's a, a, a in the grand class. It's a national guard. It's a, people who work in police, and uh, other women who work for uh, for nuclear security from different point of view of their activity. And all of them need uh, support and and uh, uh, need the uh, rights are. Uh, uh, of, according to the law. And one important thing uh, before in Ukraine, there was a list of specialties. It's prohibited to work for women in those fields. I mean, in all, in all of enforcement and the military. And only in 2017 and 18, uh, there was a change to the legislation and uh, uh, many uh, specialties is allowed right now to work women in this law enforcement agencies and uh, uh, military. And uh, for us, it was even more important because our war starts eight years ago and our women was on the battlefield and they died there on the, or they have a shot or something else that Katarina mentioned a lot of different stories about it. And now they are protecting because they can prove that they was on the battlefield and they can receive the support. And all these actions are very important. So in the, this um, uh, happened because we have men who support us, who actually uh, this uh, advocacy actually exists and uh, people understand it's important. So don't forget that uh, something is starting from the legal basis too, because we need to have a start point to raise any issues. And this is collaboration, cooperation actually goes to the productivity of our gender balance. No, of course. Thank you, Natalia. Um, let me hand over to Sharina. Um, did you have any thoughts or reflections? Um, on yeah. Today? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carl. And um, I would like to also to recall what uh, George was saying, and I think that uh, social ethics and commercial benefits uh, should come together. I, I think that um, without, um, I mean, connecting these uh, two concepts uh, to each other, I think that um, we can't get to anything. So I think that uh, um, this is one thing. Another thing, uh, so we know this glass ceiling, we know this leaking, uh, pipe, which I like to describe this gender equality somehow, because it's kind of pipe when you have women and men together in this pipe, but at certain point on different stages of, uh, I mean, life or development, uh, women and men can leak from this pipe. So, and we should be very, very sensitive, sober uh, to understand why it's happening. What, what makes these pipes not full and uh, make uh, them uh, leak. So I think this is just very general kind of reflections because we have no time to go 
deeper into policies, interactions. And one must think about Georgia. Um, of course, Georgia has all legislation. We have gender equality law, we have women, peace and security agenda action plan for now we have a new one. We have defense institution, gender equality strategies. Uh, uh, some, uh, some institutions uh, are better advancing, some less. Uh, but uh, when we speak about on the level of practice, we see that uh, not so many things are changing and we don't see these uh, visible changes. That's why I think that uh, uh, institutional support, uh, social ethics in the institutions, code of conduct, they are very important. They really affect on the behavior change. So I think that what we need, this is uh, value change, this is changes in relationship and changes in behavior. So that's, that could reflect the real transformation of our societies. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharina. Absolutely. It's one where um, I know we talked about incentives and um, just realizing the benefits, even if it's entirely self-interested um, in that approach. It, it doesn't need to be from altruism. I think there are real business benefits, uh, let alone sort of societal uh, ethics around that. Um, comfort. Um, if you're able to talk or offer your thoughts, um, uh, it was great to hear about the, um, the ways in which an organization has come through this and the the advocacy from the leadership there. Um, did you have any thoughts um, based on um, the discussion today? Okay, um, thank you, Carl. Oh, my, the discussion today is very, very germane and became at the right time. I want to, uh, all I want to do is to encourage uh, women and the nuclear security sector to keep on the good work they're doing and um, belief in themselves, keep on boosting their confidence through um, professional networking, trainings, and uh, personal development. And I can say from our end here in Nigeria, our stakeholders actually helping our women in, um, in the nuclear sector they have been very being of a good help to us. It's for us to look inward and um, keep on moving. Um, nuclear security with many women in it will, will go uh, further from here. Uh, we are not being bad so far. So we need to put more effort. We need to make more findings, more research. Like we uh, women in nuclear Nigeria, we carry out this uh, advocacy down to the primary secondary schools, encouraging them to take up courses in STEM that will virtually lead to building career in nuclear security. And I know another platform that are doing that, Women in Nuclear Africa Chapter 2, that is in that platform too, to reach out to other women, encouraging them to, uh, you know, uh, pick up these courses in STEM that will lead to, um, having a career in nuclear security. I will also have this platform of sharing information, skills and knowledges by, um, through Women in Nuclear Nigeria, Women in Nuclear African Chapter 2. So I want to say to every woman there in nuclear security, please don't give up. We are getting somewhere and we are not being bad at all. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, meeting today. I thank you again. I also have to apologize for that little natural breakage earlier. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Comfort. No, it's wonderful to have you on here and don't worry about the connection issues at all. Um, I think, um, yeah, great work, but further to go and to keep, keep the strength um, is important. Um, but Katarina, um, the final, final thoughts for you, I guess. Um, what are your thoughts or reflections on, on the themes discussed today? Uh, thank you. Um, actually, it was a rather encouraging discussion because uh, we have um, uh, perspective and we have women who speak on the gender issue from different parts of the world. It's Africa, Caucasus, it's um, Ukraine, um, UK, so United States. It, it's really um, a very encouraging message. And I'm pretty sure that um, that level of engagement of women in um, uh, all processes of the state, including nuclear security, is uh, the sign of the maturity of, of society. 
uh, and um, it was, it was a good point made by Natalia about uh, about Ukraine that now we have uh, no limits for the professions um, for for women. Um, I have clear example because there was a lady um, who was great in demining and she worked for and she studied in, in UK in um, Danish demining group to do this, but she cannot do this in Ukraine because it's forbidden for for women to conduct the mining. Now um, there is no ban anymore, and she is working productively, and it's extremely uh, important uh, important for us. And here is um, there should be a big um, uh, role of civil society who can uh, make pressure on um, state bodies to promote uh, gender equity. Um, and um, uh, such organization as uh, Black Sea Nuclear, uh, nuclear Security, Women in Nuclear is, is a good example how it, uh, it can proceed. Um, and um, speaking about this very organization, um, it's important because they do understand all the risks and they feel all the risks which are um, in the region. And um, um, uh, my key point is that there should be pressure of civil society and the uh, pressure both on governments and on international organizations. Um, as I mentioned, that organization, international organizations have no a uh, clear vision how to act in this or that uh, situation. And um, that's why I hope that, um, that it will work and uh, civil society can uh, bring um, their, um, uh, uh, their thoughts and um, their demands uh, to governments and to international organizations. And uh, it will be their um, input uh, in our um, victory as well, because uh, victory of of the civilization, because you know that if we take Russia, um, gender equity has nothing to do with Russian society. And um, uh, they are very surprised that we do have it and they, they want us not to have it. And we will fight for that and we'll bring all these um, um, values to our society, and I hope that uh, all together we can um, um, we can win. <laughs> Thank you all so much to our panelists for joining us today. Um, I, I know we are over time, but it's um, I think it's been worth it just to um, discuss these. It's an important issue, and I hope everyone feels as if they've been heard, um, regardless of their connection issues. Um, so to all you panelists, thank you for joining us. Um, it's been wonderful to share your experiences and to hear your, hear your thoughts on this subject. Um, so thank you so much. And with that, with um, time keeping in mind, um, apologies for the delays there. But otherwise, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all.